ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له وان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم اما بعد فان خير الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار اما بعد the most important thing that a person can possess and that will help on the day of judgment is al qalb al salim a healthy living sound heart and on the tongue of ibrahim alayhi salam allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us of his prayer in the quran wa la tukhzini yawma yub'athun do not disgrace me on the day when all will be resurrected yawma la yanfa'u malu wa la banun on the day when money and children will be of no help illa man ata allah bi qalbin salim except for the one who comes to allah with a sound heart meaning a heart that is alive that is healthy that is free from illness so ibrahim alayhi salam in that dua is telling us also all that when you're going to meet allah azza wa jal the things that you have in this dunya that benefit you in the dunya don't amount to much with Allah Azza wa Jal because He can impress people with how much money you have in this dunya and will help you. He can impress people by how big your family is or your business is or your degrees. These things will help you. When you come to Allah Azza wa Jal, none of these things will matter. Allah Azza wa Jal does not look at them but looks at one particular thing that people in this dunya ignore. But Allah does not. Qalbun salim. What is the state of your heart? Not how healthy you were, or how handsome you were, or athletic, how much you have achieved, how much people liked you or hated you. What is the state of your heart when it comes to Allah Azza wa Jal? That's why in the hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said inna allah la yanzuru ila suwarikum wa ajsamikum walakin yanzuru ila qulubikum wa fi riwayatin wa a'malikum he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam allah does not look at your faces and bodies but he looks at your hearts and another narration it adds to it and your deeds that is the total opposite of what humanity does when you look at someone and you want to size them up, you want to judge them, and everybody judges everybody, by the way, but we don't verbalize it. What do you judge based on? The external and the material and the achievements that are worldly. We don't look at the sincerity, the iman, the righteousness of that person. Allah Azza wa does the opposite. And He looks at, you're in my heart. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said in the hadith, At-taqwa ha huna wa ashara ila qalbih, or wa ashara ila sadrih. He said, alayhi salatu wa sallam, taqwa is here and he pointed to his chest. Meaning, where does taqwa reside? Where does it originate? It's in the heart. And people misunderstand and misapply that hadith in two opposite directions. On the one hand, those among us who would say taqwa and iman is only in the heart, exclusively there. So it does not matter what I do or I fail to do, as long as I do not hurt anybody else, I do not steal, I do not cheat, I do not kill, I do not lie then I'm okay with Allah Azza wa Jal and I'm a good person and I'm a righteous person. Whether I miss obligations or not, whether I commit sins or not, the way that they judge themselves is what Iman is here and you cannot judge me. 
And what is important is what I feel and what I do with people ignoring Allah's right. And to that we say, please listen to the following. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إن أسوأ الناس سرقة الذي يسرق من صلاته قيل وكيف يسرق من صلاته يا رسول الله قال لا يتم ركوعها ولا سجودها He said صلى الله عليه وسلم the first person the worst person in theft meaning the worst thief is the one who steals from his salah They said oh messenger of Allah how does he steal from his salah He says he does not complete its ruku' and its sujood what does it mean he does not complete its ruku' and its sujood? In another narration it says, لا يقيم صلبه في ركوعه وسجوده أو كما قال Meaning he does not allow his or her spine to rest when they go to ruku' or when they go to sujood. Meaning if you see some of us and how we pray, as soon as we go to ruku' we bounce up back. And the spine did not have time to settle. And when you go to sujood it's like chicken pecking. You go to sujood and you immediately rise up. And the body did not have time to settle and the soul did not have time to contemplate what it was doing. The Prophet ﷺ called this what? Theft. Sariqa, right? And he called it what? The worst theft. Because you are stealing from yourself and the time that you should have with Allah Azza wa Jalla and what is due to Allah. Other types of theft are serious and they have physical punishment, but this theft does the worst harm to you. So you may say, I haven't stolen anybody's money, but Rasulullah is saying that if you do not pray right, that salah is theft and it does affect your heart. And if the salah is such, it may not even count. Listen also to another hadith. He said, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man taraka thalatha juma'in tahawuna, taba'a Allahu ala qalbi. The one who abandons three Fridays out of neglect and carelessness, Allah will put a seal on their heart. Now here, of course, we're talking about those who are obligated to come to the salah, who are male, not the females. And have no excuse for leaving the salah. Tahawuna, out of neglect. They don't care. Three. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said that there will be a seal on the heart. What does it mean for a person to have a seal on their heart? Meaning that there is a barrier between them and righteousness. Between them and guidance. Between them and right and wrong. Until they repent and ask Allah for forgiveness and they come back to the Jum'ah, they will continue to have that seal. Now, did this person kill anybody? Did they steal money? Did they hurt someone? But why did that act affect their heart? How could they say, my heart is okay? After neglecting Jum'ahs. We may choose to define ourselves whatever way we want. Allah had given you that right. But that's not the definition of Allah Azza wa Jal. And that's not the definition of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you cannot say, I'm a good person and my Iman is intact and Taqwa is here and neglect your Salah or commit a haram. While Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also said, Ayyuma abdin adnaba dhanban nukitat fi qalbihi nuktatun sawda. He says, whenever a servant of Allah commits a sin, there's a black mark that it leaves on his heart. Your heart cannot be intact and sound and clean unless it's okay with Allah Azza wa Jal. So taqwa, yes, it's in the heart, but it must manifest on the body. And if it doesn't manifest on the body, something is missing from the heart. So yes, at taqwa ha But it doesn't only live in the heart. The opposite are those who neglect the heart and think that taqwa is in the body only. Meaning that we are meticulous in how we pray and how we fast and how we dress 
and maybe even how we follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam but at the same time we neglect to connect the heart to what we are doing so the body has some taqwa in it maybe because people could see what we're doing but the heart is absent and here let's take a couple of examples so that we understand this he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a hadith inna rajula la yansarifu min salatihi wa ma kutiba lahu illa ushruha tus'uha thumnuha hatta qala nisfuha alayhi salatu wa sallam he said that a person may leave their salah after they have performed it and only have one tenth of it written for them or one ninth or one eighth until he said one half of that meaning that person prayed as his salah is valid it's complete from A to Z physically but where was his heart? What was I thinking about while I was in my salah? Was there khushu' contemplation? Did I remember Allah Azza wa Jalla or was I absent? So as much of your mind that is present in the salah, when your heart is present in the salah, that's the part that is written for you. So that could be half of it or one tenth of it or less or more according to the attention that we have in our salah. So you think about it, when Allah Azza wa Jal told you to perform wudu and perform the acts of salah, the physical acts of the salah, did he ask for that to be performed for nothing? Or did he ask for that, subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he wants the heart to be brought in as the body is. He wants the heart to be compliant as the body is. Otherwise, what's the purpose of it? Right? And take Salatul Jum'ah as an example. Think about it. I want you to step back a little bit from the habit of Salatul Jum'ah and observe it from outside. You have Allah Azza wa asking His servants who will listen to Him to come to the masjid every single Friday. And there are sunnas with Salatul Jum'ah. One of them is to come early. That is, if you have the time, you're not working, and you can take the time to come early to Salatul Jum'ah, you should do that so, because when you do that, you prepare yourself for the Salah. It's also to bathe, to put, on, to put on the best clothes that you have if you are male, to put on perfume if you are male, meaning there is a physical preparation for Salatul Jum'ah. Observe this from the outside, not while you're in it, but from outside. You're watching people doing this, commanded to be doing that. They're bathing, perfume, best clothes, come early. And when they come to the masjid, they're supposed to engage in ibadah. They're reading the Quran, they're in salah. Then when the salah starts, when the khutbah starts, they are prohibited from talking to each other. You know that, right? You cannot talk to your brother and to your sister. You cannot give them salam or give salam back. You can't be on your phone. All this is haram. And then wonder, why is this so? Is it for nothing? Is it, is it an empty command? What is all this asking you to do? To listen to what? The khutbah. Not to be present in body, but absent in spirit. That defeats the purpose of coming, doesn't it? Otherwise, why are you coming if your body is going to be here, but your mind is somewhere else? You're supposed to tame your mind so that it's here. <laughs> So it can listen to something that benefits you for the rest of the week. So that you would get reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you may say to yourself, you know what? The khutbah is boring. The khatib is boring. They are inadequate. They are not eloquent. I've heard everything before. None of these things in my mind is an excuse. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did not say as long as he's eloquent, listen to him. There is something that you do on Friday that is yours regardless of what the khatib is saying or not. And trust me, that if you follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you esteem Friday, you will get something from it whether the khatib is good or not. Because just before the khutbah you've done so much. And when the khutbah starts, you're ready to listen. And you could have the worst khatib standing before of you. 
But if you have an attitude of, I'll learn something from him. You may listen to one ayah or one hadith and Allah opens your heart because of it. That's it. And I'm telling you that because Allah Azza wa Jal helped a lot of people by listening to that particular advice. One of the great scholars have said that. He said, one of the greatest advice that I've received is that it does not matter who's giving the khutbah. If you just give them a chance and give yourself a chance, you will learn something from them. So it would be such a waste to come to the salah and yet not come to the salah. If you're bringing your body, bring your heart as well. Because Allah Azza wa Jal looks at what? Your heart. So in this particular instance, yes, Allah Azza wa Jal sees you in the masjid. And yet, the, yes, the angels of Allah Azza wa Jal, if you have come before the Imam, have written your name in the registry of those who have attended. But now as you are sitting, and no one can see your heart except you, and Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah is looking at the inside. Is it listening? Is it reacting? Is it accepting? So we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us of those who pay attention to their hearts, and we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us of those who increase the taqwa of their hearts as they increase the taqwa of their bodies. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum fastaghfirullah. الحمد لله رب العالمين حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه وصلي وسلم على رسوله محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم عنا على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك أما بعد if we know that the heart is supposed to be سليم meaning free from illness the illness of shirk the illness of نفاق hypocrisy as Allah says in the Quran في قلوبهم مرض there is sickness in their heart. And as Allah Azza wa Jal also says in the Quran, فَلَا تَخْضَعْنَ بِالْقَوْلِ فَيَطْمَعَ الَّذِي فِي قَلْبِهِ مَرَضٍ وَقُلْنَ قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا When he is speaking to the mothers of the believers, رضي الله عنهُنَّ and also to wraths of women as well. And he says, فَلَا تَخْضَعْنَ بِالْقَوْلِ Don't speak softly when you're speaking to men. Don't speak softly. Meaning in a tempting way. فَيَطْمَعَ الَّذِي فِي قَلْبِهِ مَرَضٍ Lest or unless the one who has sickness in his heart be tempted by your speech. Meaning the sickness of loving zina. Not the mere admiration or temptation or listening to a soft speech coming from a female. But rather when a person hears that, he thinks to himself, there's an opportunity to disobey Allah Azza wa Jal. That is the sickness of loving zina. Wanting zina. That's the sickness in the heart as well. So if the thing that is going to help us when we meet Allah Azza wa Jal is having a healthy heart, one of the greatest things that we should actually focus on is look at our hearts and try to clean them, try to uh, rectify them, so that when we meet Allah, we have the best of hearts when we see Him. The disease of what? There are so many. The disease of envy, the disease of pride, the disease of hating other Muslims, the disease of belittling other Muslims. For instance, in the hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, بِحَسْبِ مِرِئٍ مِنَ الشَّرِّ أَنْ يَحْقِرَ أَخَاهُ الْمُسْلِمِ It is sufficient evil for a Muslim to belittle another Muslim, to look down on another Muslim. For whatever reason that is worldly, you look at them and they don't have the same education as yours, or the same color as yours, or the same background or the same gender, whatever it is, that is, belongs to jahiliyyah, you look at them and you demote them in your eyes because of that, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, that is sufficient evil to carry. So imagine one of us living his whole life, carrying that evil, thinking that they are good before Allah azza wa jal. No, that's not. And we should assume, in fact, especially at the age that we live in, that we have sick hearts, and we need to treat them. And when we say that we have sick hearts, I do not mean that you should assume that your neighbor to the right and to the left is sick, but you are free. I mean to assume that your neighbor to the right and to the left is free of sickness, but you and I are sick. 
So if I'm talking to you and you're listening to me at this particular moment, I'm confessing to you, but I want you to confess in front of yourself that your heart and mind are sick. Because unless you recognize the sickness, you're not going to move to treat it. So I and you are sick. So what are you going to do to treat the sickness of your heart? So you feel yourself detached from Allah Azza wa Jal. You feel yourself more loving of the dunya than the hereafter. Trusting people more than Allah Azza wa Jal. Fearful of people more than Allah Azza wa Jal. Isn't that weakness in the heart? You find yourself eager to disobey Allah but not obey Him. You stand in salah but you can't wait to finish it. But if you're watching something, any form of entertainment, you would want to watch more and more of it. And you don't know where the time has gone. You enjoy the dunya, but you don't enjoy the akhirah. You invest in the dunya, but you don't, enjoy, you don't invest in the akhirah. That is a heart that is not close to Allah Azza wa Jal. And that is a heart that is plagued with pride, plagued with, uh, with uh, envy, plagued with dependence on other than Allah Azza wa Jal. So the ibadah that Allah Azza wa Jal had asked us all to do is primarily targeting the heart. So when you stand in your salah, when you engage in dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal, when you are fasting, when you are making dua, do not fail to connect body and heart. Do not fail to concentrate on your heart and ask yourself, if Allah had asked me to do all of these things physically, did he ask me to do this while my heart is absent? Or does he subhanahu wa ta'ala want me to reign in my heart, to bring it, to tame it, and to grow it in obedience to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I will tell you that in the beginning it's going to be difficult. When you pick up the Quran after a long period of neglect. And you want to force yourself to read it because you know that it's good to read. In the beginning it will be difficult. And your soul will rebel. And your shaitan noticing what you're doing will attack you. And will whisper to you. And you will find distractions left and right. But if you persevere and you are patient, then the soul will submit and will start enjoying the words of Allah Azza wa Jal. So don't let the initial struggle dissuade you from continuing that struggle. Everything in life that is worthwhile requires sacrifice. And if we're not going to sacrifice for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal, you may arrive on the day of judgment bankrupt like somebody who did not sacrifice in this dunya and they will find that they will have none of it. If you want the hereafter, show Allah Azza wa Jal that you want the hereafter. And begin with your heart and begin with dua and begin with sincerity. Don't simply just be sincere on the outside and on the inside. It's a corrupt house. We ask Allah Rabbil Alameen, Arham al Rahimeen. Ya Allah, fix our hearts for us. Ya Allah, you are aware of what resides in our hearts. You are aware of our weaknesses. You are aware of the temptations that surround us. You are aware of the whispers of the shaitan that we encounter. So we ask you, Ya Rabbil Alameen, shower us with your mercy. Send on us your mercy and your rahmah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Cleanse our hearts completely as you cleanse a white cloth from all, uh, all contaminations. We ask you, Ya Rabbil Alameen, to make us of the people of Jannah. Protect us all from hellfire. Revive our hearts with Iman. Revive our hearts with Taqwa. Fill our hearts with the love of Allah, with the love of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, with the love of the believers, with the love of the Quran, with the love of the Sunnah, with the love, love of whatever you love, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And take us away from what you hate. Ya Arham al Rahimeen. Allahumma atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fi al akhirati hasanatan wa qina adab al nar. اللهم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم يا مصرف القلوب صرف قلوبنا على طاعتك اللهم عنا على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك اللهم نسألك الجنة وما قرب إليها من قول وعمل ونعوذ بك من النار وما قرب إليها من قول وعمل ونسألك الخير كله عاجله وآجله ما علمنا منه وما لم نعلم ونعوذ بك من الشر كله عاجله وآجله ما علمنا منه وما لم نعلم ونسألك من خير ما سألك عبدك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من شر ما استعاذك منه عبدك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث أصلح لنا شأننا كله ولا تكلنا إلى أنفسنا طرفة عين وأقم الصلاة